revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to another edition of Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner. It is a pleasure to have you with me, as always. Uh, now, um, depending on when this comes out, it was about two weeks ago, by the time you're listening to this, that I put an article out called Authoritarians to the Right of Me, Authoritarians to the Left. And this article has been kind of brewing in my head for months, um, as should be evident to anybody that has actually read the article and has been listening to this show for the last few months. And in it, I uh, reference the fact that apparently a lot of people horrified by what the election of Trump represents have been going out buying the book 1984. And um, as we all know, that's George Orwell's dystopic novel uh, about a massive collectivist uh, authoritarian tyranny. It's worth saying, of course, that collectivist authoritarianism is probably a bit of a redundancy because all authoritarianism is collectivist. But in this article, I um, I start about talk. I start talking about the perceived authoritarianism on the right and, and Trump and what that means but also the reaction on the left, which is becoming increasingly authoritarianism, authoritarian. It is as if uh, a lot of our progressive friends, um, especially those who kind of self-identify as uh, social justice warriors, uh, which is becoming an increasingly common phrase, especially on campuses, um, they seem to be fighting fire with fire. And it so happens that uh, today I am going to interview the president of the Young Americans for Liberty chapter of the state of Kansas. And uh, it is a very timely interview. So Maria, Maria Church, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. It is a pleasure. So what, uh, where are you a student, Maria? So right now I'm a student at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas. Okay, now uh, you're having problems on that campus getting uh what would the word be officially acknowledged as a student organization right yeah so they they call it um registered student organization status or rso status okay now why is that important so uh being an rso would allow us to like schedule rooms host events book tables without having to pay extra student fees for it for it okay and that's a pretty standard thing right for any kind of regular campus organization now (laughs) we've been hearing about speakers not being allowed to speak at campuses and certain universities you know imposing ridiculous security fees at the last minute to kind of make it logistically impossible for uh, speakers with, let's say, minority views, especially minority political and cultural views from actually coming and speaking to students. But this is kind of a little different because you're not even being allowed to kind of exist on campus, you being your university's chapter of Young Americans for Liberty. So please tell us the whole story. So uh, on March 4th, we... Uh, we turned in our, our paperwork, which um, uh, officially the university, all you have to have is is five active members, um, a faculty advisor, and a constitution that's been ratified by membership. And then you, you turn it in. The student senate reads the purpose statement one week. The next week votes. And from my understanding, the vote is uh, it's mostly procedural, a formality at that point. It, uh, uh, they've never had anybody be denied before. So wow. it, it usually passes unanimously. 
and uh, so young americans for liberty really is a pariah you must you must be evil i mean you must be awful people to be the first not to be allowed to exist on this campus <laughs> oh i mean you would think so but uh, it, i mean it really is like living in 1984 where like we've like created thought crimes on college campuses so, so you yeah so how does how does this work you were you, you were voted down by the student senate so that means what entirely a student body is that correct yeah yeah so it's uh yeah bo- both undergrad and graduate students but yeah it's totally student body right and i want to know wh- how much did how did the vote go how did it break down and what were the grounds for not allowing you to be have a chapter on on campus well i'll, I'll start by telling you that um one of my chapter members he's also in the student senate and uh he had approached me the day before it, our our resolution was going to vote and he, he told me that uh there were some questions about our organization and asked if i'd come in for there's a public forum at the beginning of each of the senate meetings so uh so i said yeah sure so i came in for the public forum and uh he approached me right before i went up and he said i guess the questions stem from Uh, Your organization's uh, purpose statement uh, is apparently, in his words, militant. Um, Would you have that purpose statement? Yeah. I would would love to hear just how militant it is. (laughs) Yeah, let me let me pull it up. But uh, so I'm I'm like just beside myself at this point. I'm thinking, oh man, I, I I thought I was being asked to come in to to speak to, like maybe the readability of our constitution. Like maybe there was something I had left out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the university requires you to put in uh, all kinds of inclusive statements and, and stuff to begin with. Um, but our our purpose statement in the constitution itself um, was provided uh, by the uh, National Young Americans for Liberty was provided by the regional director uh, at my time. And, and, uh, so this would be, re- and so this would be a purpose statement that has obviously been accepted across hundreds, hundreds of campuses across America, right? Right, right. Okay. So it, it reads uh, word for word, it shall be the purpose of the Young Americans for Liberty to train, educate, and mobilize youth activists committed to winning on principle Our goal is to cast the leaders of tomorrow and reclaim the policies, candidates, and direction of our government. Okay, so there's no specification as to as to what reclaiming constitutes or what the activists will be doing. Right, right. It's it's. I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty vague. It's pretty vague. So so now, and so the militancy was. I mean, how that, I want to know how this went down. I mean, what bit of that was militant? <laughs> you know, I I still don't know because I, <laughs> I I got to the front of the public forum and I you're supposed to give like a three minute long speech. Well, I didn't come prepared with the speech because I was only there to answer questions. So I said, uh, well, I don't I don't really have much to say. I introduced myself and I said um, I just came to answer questions. So. You know, yeah. I'll answer the questions you have. And the very first question I was asked had nothing to do with the purpose statement. I was asked, uh, "What are your organization's stances on safe spaces?" Right. <laughs> is, is that a legitimate question? Is according to the rules by which the Senate can decide, are they allowed to just basically decide based on uh, on political positions? Uh, well, actually, uh, Healy v. James, uh, which is a Supreme Court case, says that, no, they're not allowed to decide based on political opinions. Uh, that's called viewpoint discrimination. Right. Now, is there any is there any issue here with, refa- with respect to the fact that it's students themselves deciding about a student body? Does that and they are, are students free, let's say, to discriminate in a way that the university itself officially is not? Or are they not free to do so? Uh, well, my understanding is that um, since they are acting as it, they're acting in the power of the university, they're not allowed ah, to discriminate in that way. Absolutely. So, mm. right. so they could shut us down if we were going to, like, for, say, break the rules of the university that like absolutely aren't legitimate rules but um since like none of that was brought up um 
after I left, the, the debate actually centered around uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and uh, hate speech. So, um, okay, so hold on. So, so we've only got a minute on this in this first segment. So you were asked, "What are your what's your organization's stance on safe spaces?" And you replied, "Well, I, it was like I was totally unexpecting that." So my knee jerk reaction was, "Well, do we need a stance on safe spaces?" Good answer. And the answer yeah. was. And and they just kind of looked at me, so I said, well, I mean, we support free speech, if that's what you're really asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and what did you, what was the response to that? Um, so I was then grilled by several different people. I mean, I think six or seven different senators asked me different questions um, about uh, our stances on, like, what is free speech? What is hate speech? If there's a line between free speech and hate speech, um, what we what we stand okay. for different things that we advocate for on campus um i i get the idea we're going into this first break we'll uh, talk some more about this maria on the other <laughs> side this is liberty with love and i am robin kerner <laughs> I'm talking to Maria Church, the president of the Young Americans for Liberty chapter of the state of Kansas, um, who was trying to set up a chapter on her campus at Wichita State University and was having a little bit of bother with that, as we say in my native country. So, Maria, you were grilled about safe spaces and uh, your organization's views on free speech, which you uh, obviously support, um, what with it being the First Amendment and a basic human right and everything. So, um, and I guess you were kind of dazed. You came out of this weird um, little grilling session. And then what happened? Yeah, so uh, the grilling session lasted only about six minutes uh, and then I, I left. Uh, I wasn't asked to stay for the whole meeting, so I, I left. I had some family stuff to do. Uh, and when we're leaving, uh, I called our uh, our free speech director at Yao, kind of debriefed him, said, hey, I think I have a free speech issue coming up. Um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see what goes from here. And uh, I asked uh, my member that's in uh, the student senate to, to let me know ASAP if, if uh, they either debated it or – voted on our organization and uh so I'm, I'm sitting at dinner and he sends me a text and he says hey they're debating it and then almost an hour later he says the resolution failed um and so <laughs> so basically they went they went about their normal business and then uh they actually cast a live stream so i went home and watched the live stream that night of the and, debate uh, what the live stream of the debate of the debate yeah. right yeah, so so I watched it and uh, um, they debated heavily uh, over. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, Milo Yiannopoulos was the the topic of conversation for the most part. Um, apparently, some Yao chapters in the past have invited him to speak on campus, um, and uh, so they debated. They felt like it was it was. Uh, an unsafe place for minority communities because people like Milo Yiannopoulos are uh, apparently their speech is considered hate speech. Defined how? How and who defines that? <laughs> you know, I'm still trying to figure that out too. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> According was it was there any um, points made about what hate speech actually is in the debate that you watched? Uh, so nobody ever defined hate speech, um, but they. They talked a lot about the very thin line between free speech and hate speech, as they put it. And uh, one uh, one senator even said that uh, hate speech goes beyond what the Constitution protects. And uh, they were very alarmed that um, I disagreed with that publicly uh, when they were grilling me. <laughs> right. So, okay, so they decided... Okay, so how do they get from... Um, so, so the logic was, Milo is responsible for hate speech. Other chapters of your organization have invited him to speak, spout all this hatred, presumably. Um, and therefore, you should not be allowed to have a presence on campus. And that was, that was basically it, was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Essentially, that was, that was the reason. Okay, so then at that point... Um, since you have been uh, arguably discriminated against for an illegitimate reason, um, what do you do or what have you done? 
Yeah. So um, that night when I uh, finished watching the live stream, I sat down and I sent an email to the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, who uh, we've been working together previously um, with some unconstitutional speech codes on the Wichita State campus to begin with. Um, so I sat down and I wrote them an email, uh, basically it explained everything that I've just told you. Mm-hmm. And uh, the next morning they were starting to write a letter. So they, they've actually sent a letter. It's a, like a 12 page long letter to uh, President John Bardo at Wichita State um, demanding that he over overturn this decision uh, on the grounds of, of viewpoint discrimination. And do you know what's happened since he's, he's received that letter? Has anything happened since he's received that letter? You know, I, I actually haven't received any official communication from the university. They haven't even sent me like a courtesy email to tell me that my organization was uh, denied RSO status. Really? Yeah. Now, hold on. So uh, when, when uh, how long ago was it that you were denied? When was that vote? To, did that vote take place? So um, that was on April 5th. OK, so we're talking about a week ago. Right. Now, um, what do... What is the feeling on campus, uh, first, among your members, and second, among uh, those in your community who may know about this, if any? Yeah, um, so we have gotten a little bit of national coverage. um, And so I think mostly the people who know about it are the people who are directly involved. Um, the, uh, The senators who voted against it are standing their ground firmly. Um, but I think that the majority of campus is is really just outraged about it, uh, even if they don't agree with our stances. Um, we've actually received messages from both the college Republicans and the college Democrats on campus kind of telling us, even if they don't always agree with our stances, they definitely support our right to free speech and our right to, to be on campus. So now that's interesting. If you've got that kind of support from Democrats and Republicans on campus, um, so, I mean, that's indicative of broad support. How come the voters in your student Senate don't reflect that kind of broad based common sense? Are they, I'm going to use the term, so kill me, are they a concentration of uh, social justice warriors in the Senate? You know, is, is, is that really, is that what's going on here? Is it that the illiberal left, the cultural left, tends to go move towards these student political positions in campuses to be able to do the suppression that they love so much? Uh, yeah, so the the current student senate, uh, yeah, the majority of them are what we would colloquially call uh, SJWs, or now, social justice warriors. Okay, so let me ask you this because I I was educated as you know you won't be surprised from my accent. I was educated in England, and and also you know whereas um, you are a millennial or or Gen Z, I'm a gen I'm Generation X, where we didn't have this kind of nonsense, right? So this is like a foreign world to me. I mean, I'm writing about it, I'm looking at it, but um, you know I haven't experienced it uh, you know in the way that you are right now so um so i, I really want to you know get i want to get a feeling for it how is it that the rest of let us say your campus culture your campus community has allowed this uh, minority this vocal um politically quite uh, focused minority to take over, as it were, the commanding heights of campus politics. How's that happened? Uh, Well, speaking from just like a strictly practical standpoint, um, in the last election cycle before this previous one for SGA, um, there were three campaigns and uh, an incredibly low turnout. Mm -hmm. Enough said. Uh Yeah, so the, the... The campaign that won, uh, they got 50 percent, pretty much about 50 percent of the uh, of the Senate. And then uh, people from the other two campaigns um, have dropped out and they filled in with more of these people. So um, they're actually the majority of those people that voted no actually did not get reelected because there's been there. There has been a lot of uh, political contention and, and just drama, frankly, um, between the administration and the the student government and the student government and the campus. Um, so yeah, so essentially just, low turnout. <laughs> so just, so so okay. So the S the winning SJW block got fifty percent of a vote that represented what percentage of the 
uh, potential student voting population? You say low turnout. Are we talking 10% or are we talking 30%? What's low turnout? Um, without looking at the numbers directly in front of me, I sure. think the last the last election was closer to 10%. Oh, my goodness. So the reason you have uh, the authoritarian left running student campuses is because all of the sensible people, the grown-ups, aren't turning out for the votes because they, I guess they don't want to maybe get themselves um, their hands so dirtied by the politics that uh, the authoritarians want to control because, well... That's what they like doing so much. And we're going into the break. Uh, this is Liberty with Love. I'm talking to Maria Church from the state of Kansas. We're talking about campus discrimination um, against free speech. We will be back after this break. <laughs> Stairway Press is pleased to announce the publication of Robin Kerner's first book, If You Can Keep It, Why We Nearly Lost It and How We Get It Back. Jeffrey Tucker in the book's forward wrote, We seek to end government as we know it, but that is not the whole of what we seek. We also favor something beautiful. Explaining what this looks like and the rhetorical apparatus that necessarily accompanies this is the greatest value of Kerner's book. Barry Farber, award-winning talk show host, wrote, Robin Kerner's political, psychological and philosophical rampage through today's America, turning on lights we didn't even know were off takes more and more of your intellectual breath away according to how high you rated intellectually in the first place chris ann hall constitutional attorney and educator says robin kerner is a defender of liberty and a true lover of america's constitutional republic the knowledge that robin brings to his readers is sure to be instrumental in the restoration of our american foundational principles if you can keep it by robin kerner published by stairway press go to if you can keep it dot us for your pre-ordered personally signed copy Okay, Maria, so as we went into the break, you were telling me that um, the authoritarian left on campus uh, basically kind of runs things because pretty much they're the only people that show up to vote on in, in student elections, uh, more or less. Um, and everybody else kind of isn't interested, stays home or whatever, or I should say stays in their dormitories. Um, now, given what's happened to you and the fact that you, on, you, the Young Americans for Liberty, don't have a group on uh, campus because people don't, they, the Senate, the student Senate don't like your stance on free speech, which is that you think free speech is a good idea. Um, given that, given the broad-based support, is there, is this, are times are changing on campus, I guess is what I want to ask. Like, like if even the Democrats are horrified by the authoritarianism of the cultural left on, on campus, does that mean that next time for the next student elections, they're going to be turning out and there's going to be some sanity in the student body? I'm asking if there is a political reaction happening inside your campus and maybe even, maybe even more importantly, more interestingly, is that going on more broadly perhaps on campuses across America, would you say? Yeah, I, I, definitely specifically at Wichita State, uh, there was a, a huge change in res, regime, for lack of a better word. But um, uh, the the day that they voted against it was the day that the election results for the next year were ah, announced. Oh, that's the bit I was missing. So so how did the, the com, uh, composition of the Senate change then? Yeah, so the um, there were only two parties this time, and... Um, the the party that the majority of the people who voted no were in, um, they almost none of those people were reelected. Wow. So the the other party basically swept the elections. So now I I mean the whole idea of parties in a student senate I find completely anathema. You know, um, but w to give me a sense of this, these two parties. What kind of things do you do they stand on? How do they identify? Like, do they identify broadly Democrat, Republican, or or do they not use those terms at all? Like, what do they fight on for these kind of elections? Yeah, so they 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 don't use like the partisan uh, American pol political terms like Democrat, Republican. But um, one campaign, the one that ended up winning, they were running on a, a ticket of unity. Uh, in fact, the um, the president elect, the student body president elect. Um, she is like highly involved with college Republicans and is definitely more if you're like Ronald Reagan conservative. Um, but her ticket doesn't necessarily reflect that. So the, a lot of the people on the ticket have different political views than her. Mm. And, and, I, and I think that uh, 
because the majority of students, like students are, aren't flocking to organizations like Yao and, and to these alternative places. They're tired of this progressive social justice warrior echo chamber. And, uh, and so there, there's a broad appeal in, in voting for somebody who recognizes other people's opinions as well. So, I mean, if, if this is true, this is wonderful. This means we have hit peak pro- progressivism. We are past the peak left authoritarianism, at least on the campuses, you know. Maybe, I mean, is, I mean that could be really exciting. Is the pendulum now swinging back? Uh, one can only hope. Um, I, I would say from my perspective, I think it is, at least around where I'm from. Um, now, you're in Kansas, I, so that's obviously, you know, it's a, basically a red rural state. Right. And so I get when you say, you know, where you're from, do you how representative do you feel that is of others in your generation more broadly across the country? Um, you know, it, it's hard to say just because I, I don't experience life on the coast, you know, so mm-hmm. we're, we're in the heartland um, now. Wich- Wichita is is definitely the most progressive city in Kansas. Sure. So we we do have that going. We are we are a little dot of blue in a giant pool of red. Um, so to see such change here, I think could be indicative of what's going on nationally. And are there conversations about this? There must be conversations going on about this, um, at the kind of the executive level of Yao. Uh, what, you know, what feelings are you hearing that other folks of your generation, um, other students have about this? You know, honestly, I think, people are so tired of being told what to do. Yeah. Um, it, it goes back down to like the, the core tenets of, of what it is to be um, not in that authoritarian circle and in that, you know, small L libertarian circle of, you know, we want the government out of our social lives and out of our wallets. So I think there is, there's broad appeal in my generation to that idea. And uh, I think that they're rapidly coming towards groups like, yeah, like SFL um, even yeah. So, so you know, is it possible that a year from now that you, as the uh, um, chairman of uh, this, your state's what Yao chapter, if you still are, will be saying, "Oh yeah, we've had a membership um, explosion, uh, not because everybody had gone off and read Rothbart and Hayek, but because people are looking to oppose this." Um, this thing that they see that is so oppressive um, and so condescending. And and I wonder actually if oppressive and condescending is how people of your generation do view uh, the social justice warrior left. Would they be using those words too? Or am I assuming too much? Um, well, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think we are going to have a huge membership spike. Um, we've already had a membership spike and it's only been a week. Um, <laughs> we, were, we were six members and uh, we had four or five new people come to our meeting this week. Um, so we're already hitting a membership spike. And, and, and part of that is, is awareness. Uh, but part of that is people are so fed up with this. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, – condescending is definitely a word I would use to describe it. So, so now the people who are fed up, do they have anything in common? Would you say like, are their political views broadly distributed or do they tend to be more conservative? For example, I think it, it kind of depends on where you are, honestly. Mm. Um, but I'm getting people from, from across the spectrum. Um, even, even before this, uh, my membership included a registered Democrat, a registered Libertarian, and a registered Republican. So, so there is this broad appeal, um, and and I think that what everyone has in common is we just want to be left alone. Yeah, <laughs> the fundamental right of all Americans, the right to be left alone, and the fundamental duty, um, you know, is the duty to take the consequences, right, of whatever it is you choose to do whilst you're being left alone. That's uh, I think it was. Um, Judge Napolitano, who said something very similar to that, and it's it, it, it's de- it's profoundly true. Now, if you are getting, let's say, an influx, if we kind of project this, if there is going to be an influx of members 
and an increase in interest in liberty um, in reaction to this left-wing authoritarianism. Do you see that this is going to change the kind of things that groups like Yao spend time thinking about, teaching, talking about? Is it it going to change kind of, in in a sense, maybe the philosophical flavor of um, libertarian groups in in the U.S., would you say? You know, I, I don't know if it will because I, I think specifically, yeah, like we're 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 so founded on on the principles of liberty that uh, an influx of people from left or right, mm. I, don't, I don't think can really change those core values. Yeah, no. Well, it makes sense that the core values are strong. I just wonder if um, topics like free speech are going to become more important than topics like sound money, for example. You know, maybe maybe libertarianism and libertarian groups are becoming uh, broader churches. You know. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, I mean, we have a national campaign at Yale called the Fight for Free Speech, and and we are we're leading the charge in this campus activism. And I mean, if you really think about it, uh, we can't. We can't have conversations about uh, anti-war or sound money or um, or e- even a decrease in taxation if we don't have the freedom to say those things. No, uh, because a lot of those are unpopular opinions to begin with. So uh, it really starts with the free speech and moves up from there. Absolutely, and it sounds like uh, people of your generation are increasingly getting that right, whether they're of the left or of the right. They're increasingly getting that because they're experiencing the cost and the nastiness that comes with forgetting it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, uh, like I said a minute ago, I I think that uh, these libertarian-based groups, especially, yeah, we we offer just like such a fresh alternative, Mm. really, to the echo chamber on the university campuses. Um, People are tired of hearing the same thing from from not just the students, but the professors. Um, and and they're looking for somebody who who is logically yeah. consistent and reasonable. Okay, so you preempted where I wanted to go next because we've still got five minutes in the segment. And I wanted to ask you, what is it like in the classroom? Um, you know, I, I you know, obviously we know that from work uh, of people like Jonathan uh, Haidt, which I recommend to everyone, that um, especially in the social sciences in American education, you've got a massive bias towards uh, the left. Depending on the, the, the field that you look in, you're looking nine to one progressive to conservative um, or even up to 20, 30 to one progressive to conservative in some uh, disciplines. Now, um, so there's a lack of viewpoint diversity. What is it like to be a student in that situation do people start to fidget and go i'm not getting what i'm paying for here i mean i know we've got to a point where even professors who self-identify liberal are saying my god we've made a monster uh in education and um we have to address uh this this suppression of uh of viewpoint diversity intellectual diversity what do you feel about that what is it like to be taught in this environment so uh, I, I personally haven't experienced too many teachers that are just like so like really just like militant progressive um, where they just like absolutely shut down any freedom of expression. Uh, I'd say the majority of the professors I've had are definitely on the progressive left, but um, uh, maybe it's just because I am so outspoken and I'm, I'm not afraid to voice that opinion. But um, I personally haven't experienced it. Okay. Now, I also I'm not taking these like gender study and, and women's studies classes either where i think we really see a lot of it in those social work social science classes Mm -hmm. but yeah we know we definitely know that it's worse there so okay so this is good so unless so students aren't feeling intimidated in the classroom not at least where you are uh well i'm not feeling intimidated i can't speak (laughs) for everyone (laughs) is it it a conversation that comes up on canvas or not not even yeah so uh i'm actually an education major so my my degree is going to be in in secondary education um so uh politics inevitably comes up in that because it's like education is so intertwined with national politics um and uh everyone knows where i stand but i still say it anyway (laughs) yeah absolutely so where are things um where are things now for you as an organization what uh what are you doing? Are you just holding in tight and waiting to get your courtesy email that you've been waiting for? Or, I mean, you, you, got, you mentioned that you got in touch with FIRE and that they wrote this 12-page letter to the university. Uh, 
what next and what do you expect to happen it's hard to say what's going to happen next um from from my standpoint uh we're fighting this uh and this is how we're doing it we're we're, we're trying to turn the public pressure on you know um and it, it, it's really going to be a grassroots movement um if the, we, if the composition of the Senate has changed, Maria, when can you just take it back for another vote at the Senate? Because if it's got changed, maybe they're just going to do the, the right thing and allow you to exist. Uh, well, in I think it's in three weeks is when the new student Senate takes over. Uh-huh. But, um, but there, I don't think there's enough time to reintroduce it so that it would be voted on this semester. So I, I think that if we were going to go that route, we would actually have to wait till the beginning of next semester. Ah, okay. So with that said, what does the grassroots movement that you're trying to set up would be to get the university president to just make the decision to overrule this, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and that's kind of what we're looking for anyway. We are, this is a, a, as much about spreading awareness about the fact that this is happening. We're not the only school mm. that this is happening to. Mm. And, and we're not the only... Uh, the only school that is experiencing maybe not this level but experiencing definitely the suppression of free speech so um alerting people to the fact that this is happening that creates that creates good not just for me and not just for my chapter in allowing us to be on campus but um really push back against the uh the authoritarianism that's on campus um is it possible that your university president is good and doesn't need this pressure that the president was intending to overrule this anyway because it's obviously the right thing to do and he has a public responsibility? I'd say there is some chance he's good. I I, I would never wish to speak ill of somebody's character, so uh, I'm not going to be too quick to the judgment. But I will say that it has been um, it has been a full calendar week since the decision was made and nothing has occurred yet. So you can make your own judgment there. Okay, when when was your president first requested uh, to deal with this? Like, was that a week ago? Was he immediately requested and he's been sitting on it a week? Or did he just get the memo two days ago? Because that kind of makes a difference. Yeah, um, he received a letter from FIRE on Friday morning. And we are, as we're recording this on Wednesday, so it's been five days. Right. And there's been no communication with you. No communication. Uh, I heard I you know, heard you, through you, the grapevine that there has been some talk, but um, it hasn't been like publicly addressed. You know where I come from, my in my native land, that would just be called bad manners. <laughs> <laughs> manners in politics are actually, um, or, or in public service, are actually quite valuable things. So, well, so he must know that you're sitting around wondering what on earth is going on, right? Uh, I'm sure. I, uh, frankly, I think he's probably sitting around also wondering what on earth is going on. I think uh, this is just like shook the whole university. No, this has never happened before. And so I think they're they're trying to, to do some uh, risk analysis and really figure out where to go. All right. I think they're thinking too much. All they need to do is do the right things, uh, act, right thing and act on principle. <laughs> Okay, Maria, we're coming to the end of this show, but if anybody else out there listening to this uh, feels like me that all this nonsense has to kind of stop and uh, we need uh, a lot more free speech on campus and maybe they want to support Yao um, and support you specifically and your chapter specifically, how can they do that? What should they do? Um, So you've you've got a few options. You can go to thefire.org. Um, they'll have our case profile on there. Um, you can view the article uh, that they've written about us. You can view the letter that they've sent to the president of Wichita State, and you can actually um, attach your name to that to that letter as well. Um, you can directly contact the university. Um, at, it's at wichita.edu. Um, uh, Fire has has given President John Bardo's email, which is president at wichita.edu. Um, and so if you want to speak directly to him, you can send a, an email directly to him. Uh, or, or you can go online to yaliberty.org, and that's our national website. And uh, Yaliberty.org. I just want to repeat that. It's YA for Young Americans, liberty.org. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so uh, there's options to to uh, donate to our cause there and um, 
that donation it really goes to uh, funding the projects like uh, protesting these unconstitutional speech codes and uh, more general things like educating the whole student body about um, what the principles of liber- liberty are. Yeah, absolutely. And I should say, you know, the young, young, um, young Americans for Liberty around the place here and there, they've got chapters all over the country. Uh, they've invited me to speak. I've done some trainings for some of their groups. And, um, you know, uh, so they appreciate, I appreciate what they do, because I know they appreciate what I do. Uh, we are all very much on the same uh, side. And a lot of these Liberty groups on campus, they have different flavors. There's Yal has a different flavor from Students for Liberty, but we are all in the room for Liberty. And so, you know, I indeed urge all my listeners to support and in relation to this um do please check out my article authoritarians to the right of me authoritarians to the left it is all about this issue uh, writ large and i'm very excited that it seems to have got a lot of attention which tells me a lot of people care about this and speaking to you maria it sounds like increasingly more people care about it which is fantastic this is liberty with love thanks maria church for being with me tune in next week Revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm If you appreciated this episode of Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner, then please go ahead and like it, subscribe to my channel, and maybe check out one of the other episodes like this one here.